So first of all, uh, welcome everybody to our um, uh, first session of our panel uh, on breaking narratives, connecting the known with the unknown. Uh, nice to meet you here virtually. It's a pity we, we cannot meet in Helsinki uh, face to face, um, but um, I'm uh, hopefully we, we can meet in two years um, then in, in normal circumstances. Um, just some technical um, aspects at the moment. Um, I've, I've been told if possible or if there are uh, problems, please use uh, headphones because the session is uh, has been recorded. Um, otherwise, um, you know it, you, I've, I've seen most of, of the people are sk skilled after one year of Zoom sessions. If you are not speaking, please mute uh, your, your microphone. Um, so there are no feedback um, effects. And maybe if there are problems with the, with the uh, bandwidth of the internet, <clears throat> you can uh, mute the, the video too. Um, hopefully it works. If there are uh, any technical issues, please um, write to the chat or um, I've sent the speakers around my, my uh, phone number. So um, I think we can solve uh, this. Um, we will use the uh, Zoom chat um, if you if you want to comment or if you have questions. Um, and also, um, probably it's it's a good idea to use the the, the Zoom chat uh, for questions because we will have uh, all um, discussions at the end of the panel just to to to, um, to um, yeah have enough time. And time is uh, the next point. Um, we have 105 minutes for each session. Uh, three minutes already are gone. So this is little more than one and, and a half hour. I will give you um, a, a sign. If you are reaching the time limit, please uh, uh, try to, to, to aim for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I will not uh, throw you out, but we... I, I think it would be uh, nice to have enough time for, for discussions. So, um, yes, we have um, a rich program and um, very interesting uh, topics, uh, breaking narratives, connecting the known with the unknown. And um, we played with the, this um, double, um, uh, double nature of breaking narratives which can be read both as a strategy and a, pro a process. Narratives can trigger irritation and change. Narratives can be broken uh, and can be deconstructed. But what happens exactly at this moment when the possibility of something different opens up when something new emerges but has yet to take shape? This is the, the red uh, thread of uh, our session. And I think uh, we sh should start with the first um, first paper. Uh, first is Alf uh, Arvidsson, a professor at uh, Umeå University, Sweden. Please, um, I will uh, spell most of the names wrong. Please um, don't, uh, please, uh, maybe you can tell us how it is spelled uh, rightly. And um, Alf is um, speaking about narrative ideologies. Alf, the follower is yours. Number one, uh, unmute. Uh, Alf Arvidsson is how I pronounce my name. And uh, my take on breaking narratives is uh, by uh, deconstructing the mythology of storytelling. Uh, I want to share a screen with you. Uh, so you can see my PowerPoint here. Yeah, and uh, I draw uh, upon uh, uh, some material from uh, our, uh, our project, Oral Narrative as Intangible Cultural Heritage and Social Force. But I also draw on notations I've been doing since uh, the mid-1980s, uh, when there was uh, starting to be signs of a kind of movement uh, on uh, 
oral storytelling. Uh, some some people called it revitalization, and uh, some uh, people just said, oh, it's an, a new thing." And since 1990, they they have uh, they are outspoken of we are a movement, a storytelling movement in, in Sweden. So uh, this presentation is uh, very compressed, uh, where I uh, try to bring bring down uh, the ideo ideology behind the sto storytelling or myths about storytelling that circulate in, in this uh, in this movement and uh, uh, when you ask people or when, when you read what they have written in self presentation you can uh, get get things like the storytelling movement is revitalization of folk tales and folk legends, or it's a new kind of old performing art, uh, some one, ma one man theater in one way. It's a way of shaping a public channel for oral history. Uh, it's a reformation of the teacher's role. Uh, or it's uh, more general. It's uh, this uh, movement is about drawing attention to the importance of narratives in society. So taken together, it's uh, it's not the same stories or the same genres. It's not the same storytellers. Uh, it's not the same audience. So it's a rather loose movement uh, network uh, that is quite heterogeneous. And uh, this heterogeneity is further qualified when we talk in terms of different fields where storytelling is used productively. Uh, here I have uh, pinpointed seven fields where storytelling is active and productive. Pedagogy, uh, as I said, the uh, schools and teachers use storytelling. It's the arts, uh, or what uh, is called uh, platform storytelling. Um, it, it's a part of cultural heritage. It's used in corporate storytelling in organizations and business uh, for advertisement. It is used in health discourses in, in medicine. It, it's used in politics. And storytelling is used in academia. And uh, uh, to, to give an idea of how uh, this um, uh, heterogeneity is played out, I also plotted out here in the columns A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, seven storytellers that I met. Uh, and uh, as you can see, they, they each have their own distinct profiles. Uh, uh, as you see, the person I call A uh, is actually a, a teacher who is working a lot with uh, introducing storytelling as a pedagogic device. And furthermore, he is also uh, is not only working with this in a practical way, but it's also uh, writing studies in education and uh, in introducing this in uh, academia. And uh, person B is more of a platform storyteller, uh, but, uh, 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 who who also uh, so, sorry he, he's um, he's active in a local history society and, and also has uh, local politics on his agenda and so on. Uh, uh, so there are quite uh, quite a few distinct fields where the storytellers are active and they need different kind of ideologies or uh, 
let's say the uh, ideology, ideological underpinning differs uh, uh, with, with the, what field they are active in. Uh, I'd like to start uh, with the idea of st stories uh, are seen as an all-encompassing format for knowledge and communication. And uh, furthermore, uh, they, they say that it's a superior form for communication. And this is uh, perhaps at the root of the storytelling movement, um, and, and making people conscious of uh, how stories are the perfect means of uh, communication. And of course, we have some problems here. All experiences can't be neatly fitted into a narrative scheme especially recollections of traumatic experiences. Uh, and uh, uh, f furthermore, uh, the focus on narrative uh, reduces a lot of other ways of knowing by proverbs, lists, commandments, uh, learning by doing, etc. Here is another uh, saying stories are a, a good tool for an inclusive democracy. A common saying is everyone has their own narrative. And sometimes with the addition, everyone also has a right to be heard, to have their story heard. This would be a life story, a personal narrative of a turning point in life or a victim claim. To get your story heard in the public sphere is to get access to the public space to be included. And uh, of course, here we also have problems. Uh, this could lead to reinforcement of stereotypes. Uh, there are the problems of the stigmatized vernacular, where, when you know that people don't want to hear your story or that they will look down at you if, they, if you tell your story. And that's also the question of, what should happen if, after people have had their story told? Uh, what is the responsibility of the listener? Uh, the next uh, storytelling is emancipating and enriching. And th there are many success stories, quiet children who loosen up and suddenly dares to speak in class. There are teachers that become better teachers. Uh, the company or organization works more smoothly and more efficient together. And, and there is, uh, of course, uh, the consciousness raising. Oppressed people become self-confident. And uh, so uh, uh, the problem, one of the problems here I see is uh, that Okay, if you are a teacher and you, uh, you aim at uh, getting children to get more self-confident uh, and so on, you've got to have a large repertoire of good stories uh, in, in order to get this function. And there's also the problem of uh, there are never any negative cases. There are always uh, success stories, but... Uh, uh, there, there are seldom uh, negative cases reported. Stories are cultural heritage. Yes, this is a strong uh, uh, position, and we as ethnologists and folklorists, uh, we also claim this. And uh, here we have the problem of, of what stories uh, should be included. We can't have all stories. Uh, so, um, uh, how, how do we choose the, the stories? Uh, and, and also, uh, the, there's a problem of uh, identity politics or conflicting uh, stories, etc. We have also those more that are more specific specific for ethnologists and folklorists, and I would uh, talk about as uh, a kind of reflexivity uh, th that we need to uh, 
go into now and then. How has our, since 200 years, what we've been saying of folk tales, uh, what, uh, what has happened with those ideas when they have spread uh, among, among people? Well, th there's an idea of the folk tale uh, that is understood as an inclusive and homogenous concept. Uh, indigenous myths, pedagogical fables, hero tales, Grimm's Märchen and Sagan are all rolled into one and the same. Uh, despite all, all the difference in structures and theme and function and so on. So here I w uh, just wonder, what happens or what are the intentions when, an, when a narrative is presented as a folk tale? What are the understandings of the narrative that the storyteller is trying to invoke by calling something a folk tale? Uh, closely related is the idea of uh, uh, folk tales uh, as a good tool for personal development. Here I see a strong influence uh, from Bruno Bettelheim uh, that uh, from the early 80s in Sweden uh, brought in folk tales as a uh, good, good tool for per personal development. Um, I'll just leave it there. And uh, uh, there are some other uh, ideas circulating as well, but I, but I will uh, stop here. Now I'll go on uh, to talk about some topics of dissent uh, within the storyteller movement, or perhaps uh, there, uh, often there isn't uh, any dissent, uh, but uh, just a, a great width of tolerance. Uh, one topic where ideologies diverge is uh, orality and literacy, uh, where, um, uh, thank you, uh, there's a strong ideology about storytelling uh, that it should be oral. But in fact, uh, ma many storytellers take their stories from books, from the Grimm Brothers and other collections. So it's uh, uh, more kind of uh, argumentation that somewhere in, in behind it all, it once was uh, an oral tale. Uh, there's the local versus global. Uh, on, the, uh, one, uh, on one hand, we have the, the ideas of the local stories, the local legend, local history. And, and, and all, uh, on the other hand, we have the professional storytellers that wa want to uh, go around uh, the whole country and bring in stories from all over the world. There's truth versus fantasy, uh, especially when, when it comes to uh, people telling their own story. Uh, there, there could be some, some heat about, uh, is, is it fact or is it fantasy? Is it for real or is it entertainment? Uh, and uh, uh, Art and life is about, about um, a variant of the, the former. And there's uh, uh, the question of, uh, can you be an expert in storytelling? Well, we have people that, that are working professional as uh, storytellers. But, it, but it's also this ideology of uh, storytelling as a all human competence. Uh, uh, resource available available to all humans. Uh, that uh, uh, sometimes this is bridged by uh, the storytellers also leading courses or uh, or making the storytelling performance into a situation where people 
are encouraged to swap stories with, with each other. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, that's uh, all. Thank you. Fine, perfect. Um, we are totally in time. Thanks a lot, Al, for this uh, important um, paper. Uh, there are many aspects, um, but as, as I told, we should uh, keep it for discussion. Um, and but it's very important to to debunk uh, a lot of these myths about storytelling. Let's go on to the uh, next paper. Um, it's from Marina Jatschuk, a researcher at University uh, Eichstätt in Germany. And she will speak about um, mysterious stories, liminal narratives, breaking orders. Marina, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, yes, mysterious stories. Um, I remember when I was a teenager and we had a pyjama party with my friends at home. We were talking about boys and criticizing other girls, watching movies and eating junk food. But we all waited for the moment when my mother appeared to see if everything was okay. Something typical of Argentinian control freaks, mom. And we asked her to tell us the scary story that she knew. With her so special voice and her way of narrating, my mother unfolded a series of stories, supposedly true and happened to a friend of a friend, that made our blood run cold for the rest of the night. There were stories about women dressed in white who appeared on the road in the middle of the night, about some near-death experiences with a typical tunnel vision, Stories about poltergeists, fatal premonitions, and dangerous games like the Ouija, or abductions carried out by mysterious beings from outer space. Over time, I learned that most of my mother's stories were what British call modern Sagan Hafti Geschichten, so modern legends, and it became clear to me how present uh, is the dimension of uncanny and extraordinary actually in our everyday life. The term mysterious refers to that which uh, is not known or where we can't uh, find a scientific explanation. And it's related to other terms such as um, extraordinary, unknown, abnormal, uncanny, strange, supernatural, paranormal. Those terms refer to borderline phenomena, um, phenomena of contradictory nature that on the one hand confront us with the lack of knowledge, on the other hand, are part of everyday life and popular culture. However, the mysterious is always a relational term because it is extraordinary or abnormal, always um, um, only relating to what we assume or recognize as ordinary or normal. But what is a myster mysterious story? Its categorization is difficult because the phenom phenomenology involved is heterogeneous and porous. An example of this can be seen in the analysis of the topics of the journalists of mysterious of, of, of mystery in Spain, a kind of journalism uh, specialized on this area. It can be seen that the type of journalist understands mysterious from a very broad point of view, from topics related to science, technology, technological advances and cultural phenomena to anomalies or classic uh, paranormal cases such haunted ho houses, ghost apparitions, ufology, cryptozoology, psi phenomena, EVP, etc. Uh, actually, since our childhood, we are faced with the dimension of the mysterious and extraordinary, for example, through fairy tales. Fairy tales are full of magic and phenomena that do not correspond to later other logic. Um, archetypes, figures, appear there who are later still part of mysterious narratives. An example of this could be the idea of the magical helper. We will find this archetype, for example, in the third man factor stories, narrative about persons who, um, who is in a, in a situation of extreme danger and feels the presence, hears the voice, 
or has the vision of a being uh, that is with him or with, he, with her who gives him or her peace and give guidance towards the solutions or for the way out of the situation. Stories that in turn are very close to the um, narrative of guardian angels. When we grow up, the dealing with other discourses like the scientific or religious one suppresses the magical and the extraordinary. However, the mysterious is not destroyed directly. It survives on the edge, always seeping through and taking other nar narrative forms. Besides its extensive um, as literary and cinematographic element that because of time reasons I will not discuss here, the mysterious can appear, for example, as news. The first systematization of strange and extraordinary phenomena was carried out by Charles Ford. In his book of, da uh, of the Damned, Ford collected information about anomalous phenomena, like the rain of objects, UFOs, or parts, apparitions, from magazines and newspapers. Uh, Ford categorized them, commented uh, on the expl explanations uh, of the newspaper, and added his own uh, hypothesis. Ford's work was translated, and that is the reason because uh, this work is very important, uh, was translated into many languages and led both the formation of societies specialized in the study of anomalies, as well as the creation of the first journals on anomalous phenomena. The mysterious as news um, remains until today, as for example, in the mystery journalist media for formats in Spain. The world of uh, mystery was always related to, um, to the scientific discourse, although not always in a positive way, because the scientific discourse always tend to marginalize the world of extra extraordinary experiences and in alternative interpretations. However, we can observe a double process. On the one hand, the scientification of mysterious narratives and practices. On the other hand, the organization of scientific knowledge. Paranormal or extraordinary phenomena have tried to be studied and understood using scientific narratives and methodological frameworks, framing the phenomena in theories, concepts, carrying out observation, measurement, verification, experiments, laboratory studies, or fieldwork. Good example for that uh, is, um, are the ghost hunters, or in this case, what you see, the paranormal investigation handbooks, where we can find references to the investigation process and its steps, documentation and sources, research te techniques, such as interviewing witness witnesses, uh, about the psychology of witnesses, how to protocol fieldwork, how to use technology. In these handbooks, if we remove the object of the studies, that is the paranormal, we find a purely scientific narrative that would be applicable in some moments to research in natural science and in most of the other moments to so social science in general. On the other hand, we can observe mysterious narratives trying to fill the gaps of scientific knowledge with alternative interpretations. A good example of this is the ancient alien TV show based on Eric von Däniken's theory of pre-astronautic, especially in the interpretation of archeologi ar archeological artifacts and ancient civilizations. In this TV show, the interview experts try to give alternative interpretations of supposed historical gaps through the recovery of the mythical narrative. The new mythical narrative connects with old cosmologies and reinterprets them with the theory of the visit of aliens in ancient times. Thus, the ancient gods are interpreted from a mythical, now ufological narrative. Many of the ghost apparitions, whether in rural places, in public buildings or private houses, can be taken as a rupture of the collective memory, a memory that selects those things that should be remembered from those that should be forgotten. The ghost is usually a victim. A victim who, given a message or not, it, uh, with its appearance, tells a story that has been silenced or denied. There are those who fell in wars, victims of genocide, racial and religious viol violence, 
women killed at the hands of metro and patriarchal societies, socially marginalized or vulnerable actors such as children and elderly persons, victims of accidents and catastrophes denouncing technical and human failures. The ghost bursts in and the narrative around it serves to remember and to perpetuate the denied memory. A good example for that is the EVP of Belchite. EVP is the electronic voice uh, phenomena. Um, the Spanish town Belchite was the scenario of one of the most symbolic battles of the Spanish Civil War. As a result of the fighting, the town was destroyed. Paranormal, paranormal researcher took audios, actually EVP, in this abandoned town, where you can hear the sounds of the battle live. Um, we can hear that later, maybe. <laughs> so the, uh, the audio updates the memory of the civil war in this case, uh, an historical event that still implies struggles in the construction of the modern Spanish collective memory. Mystery could appear as well as tourist and um, as, as tourist narrative and performance. The tourist, uh, tourism of mystery has flourished in the recent years. In the most important cities of Europe, for example, city tours can be booked where the visitor can see places of the city, including spots outside from the traditional tourist circuits, where the stories of appeared monks, haunted houses, places where witches were executed, and meetings of secret lodge are told. The stories show the uh, other history of the city. However, they do not stop referring to the official history and so contribute to the construction of urban identities. A good uh, example for that is, in this case, what you see, the uh, magic city of Toledo in Spain. Last but not least, Mysterious appears also, uh, also as humor. As a joke, the Mysterious could confront us with the example of the frontiers of ras rationality and belief. Here, simplified in the meme about the presenter of ancient aliens TV, TV show, who explains everything with the existence of aliens. Or uh, the uh, mysterious uh, jokes uh, could face us with the little dissonances of the everyday and social life. Here can we see the memes about Iker Jimenez, the Spanish journalist of mystery, who always starts the, his TV show, Cuarto Milenio, saying, tonight in Cuarto Milenio, the strange case of blah, blah. Okay, my conclusions or co reflections about that. Uh, mysterious uh, story, of breaking rules or not? The dimension of mysterious let the unsaid, the exiled, the social pain, the uncertainty, the knowledge gap, the doubts about paradigms, the little enigmas of every day, the excluded to break into everyday life. That cultural dimension looks for different narrative genres and performative ways to make visible the, in the invisible. But Mysterious does, uh, does that not from outside of the order like we usually um, think, but from a kind of fierce place, from the liminality that the phenomena supposed to have. Like Baker and Bad say, Mysterious violate a number of binaries held as a central tenets of human and especially Western thought, like body, mind, life, death, past, present, presence, absence, human, non-human, material, immaterial. This in-betweenness gives the mysterious phenomena a potentially powerful cultural position onto which varying cultural manifestations can be projected. So connecting the known with the unknown, the dimension of mysterious is breaking the rules while constructing orders as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shin. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marina, for this uh, inspirational uh, talk. Um, and um, Yes, uh, the question of uh, of breaking the rule of uh, transcending the borders. I think th this will give important uh, input to the discussion later. Thank you.
So um, while we stay in the uh, same realm of the extraordinary, um, the, um, I may introduce my co-chair, uh, Petr Janicek. He is assistant professor yeah. at Charles at University um, uh, in Prague, Czechia. And he will speak about breaking the cafe, uh, cafe pub split, vernacular uh, narrative practices concerning coronavirus COVID-19 in the post-truth uh, Czech Republic. Petr, the floor is yours. Thank you, Helmut. I will start my presentation. <clears throat> okay, my presentation will be maybe a little bit obscure, but I will try to be as clear as possible. I will be talking about na vernacular narratives or narrative practices concerning the uh, coronavirus COVID-19 in the contemporary Czech Republic with connection of the so-called the cafe pub split, which is local stuff. Oh, yes, sorry, doesn't work. Okay, was the cafe pub split? The Czech society became polarized along the lines of the so-called cafe pub split, which is basically the imagined divide between, let's say, the pro-Western liberal urbanites and the nationalist conservative leftist uh, inhabitants of the rural areas. And this split is uh, talked about in the media at least since 2015. My paper is based on folkloristic fieldwork because I'm mostly a folklorist. Uh, this fieldwork consisted of oral and online interviews, as well as ethnography of the Czech internet, like Czech language internet, supplemented by media content analysis. And this, pipe, this paper tries to interpret several texts and also argumentation strategies shared by the both sides, let's say, of this ideological divide. Uh, this is part of ongoing uh, longitudinal documentation project, which has been partly published in Czech, in one, my book, it's annotated collection of contemporary folklore, like urban legends and e-lore, which was published last year. Okay, what's the Prague Cafe? What's the Czech pub? Yeah, it's, as I, as I told before, it's imagined the right of the Czech society, uh, the, according to supposed stereotypical political and ideological views and cultural practices. So it's, it's imagined, it's constructed. The Prague Cafe is the picture, uh, is, is the picture up there. Uh, this, this term was started to be used by media, first by social media, then by the nationwide media since 2014. Actually, the term Prague Cafe was used also uh, during the Second World War to denote intellectuals uh, during the so-called protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia under Nazi occupation. And interestingly, the same term was used during the communist rule, uh, during the state socialism in the 50s. Yeah. But with little different context, it was about about uh, somehow somehow uh, scapegoating intellectuals. Contemporary Prakafa is much much uh, wider. Prakafa is basically people who are supposedly more pro-Western, pro-European Union, more liberal, poss possibly more right-wing, possibly more cosmopolitan, possibly more educated, and uh, possibly more wealthy and. Uh, more specifically, they live in big cities, mostly in Prague. And the opposite term is a Czech pub. This term is newer. It started to be used uh, since 2015. It doesn't have any precedence during the communist times uh, or during the Second World War or before or Austrian times. And Czech pub is supposedly more nationalistic, a little bit more anti-European Union, a little bit partly more pro-Russia. A uh, little bit more conservative, uh, nativist, nostalgic for the communist times, and possibly less educated uh, and, these and less wealthy, let's say, inhabitants, not much of rural areas, but rather smaller towns or middle sized towns in Czech countryside. So, this is imagined. It's symbolical, identitarian meta narrative, which has almost no basis in social reality, almost no basis in social stratification, and according to sociological. Uh, surveys almost no uh, uh, basis in real political or ideological le leanings of social groups. Uh, because according to sociologists, last year there was a big, big survey, there are six main identity classes in Czech society. I know not just two, two of them. Uh, uh, this terms, both of these terms originated in the mid-2000s. Uh, the main reason was Web 2.0, uh, especially electronic social networks. In Czech case, it was especially Twitter. 
uh, in Czech society, it's quite interesting. Twitter is used mostly by politicians, journalists, and celebrities, not just common people like in the US or, or other countries. And later, this, this term started to be used uh, on Facebook. Okay, some, some example, when this divide started to shape, It was 2013 where, where the first popular vote of Czech president took place. People, for the first time, uh, common people could elect the Czech president. I start, I, uh, I chose the worst pictures possible for both of these candidates. <laughs> Maybe they are worse, I don't know. Uh, that, that guy down won. And uh, you can see this, 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 uh, this imagined... Uh, Imagine traits of this candidate. The first is Karl Schwarzenberg. And Prague Cafe uh, described this candidate as gentleman from old aristocratic fa family of von Schwarzenberg. Uh, it ties to Václav Havel and anti-communist dissidents, uh, ties to contemporary cosmopolitan and pro-European political parties, such as the Green Party, a top, top zero nine, it's a right-wing party, and like cool. But Czech Pub described the same person uh, as too old, Senal, degenerate, elitist, aristocrat, sleepy Schlafenberg, it's from German word Schlafen to sleep, yeah, Schwarzenberg, Schlafenberg. He has ties to the cold Brussels elites. He doesn't speak proper Czech. He wants to restore nationalized forests back to nobility, which was actually nationalized after the First World War, which uh, Catholic Church or Sudeten Germans, German minority in this country. And he's and the most important was he, he's not he's not authentic. Yeah, he's like fake. Yeah, that's the main main term. And the other Miloš Zeman, Prague Cafe, uh, this kind of, uh, it's interesting. It's the same basically. It's, he's also too old for these people. Yeah, for the other people, he's degenerate. But he's populist. He's nationalistic. He's too leftist. He has uncle backing ties to Russia and China. He's alcoholic. He wants to sell everything to China. He's definitely not cool. Yeah. And Baduček Pab viewed this described narrative about this guy differently. He's actually very educated. He's witty. Uh, he ca he's cracking jokes. He has respect to common people, not like Schwarzenberg. He loves to drink, which is like popular. Basically, he's one of us. He's not interested in money. He's authentic. Yeah. So it was it was very uh, it's very, very about authenticity. And the second guy won. Yeah, and since 2013, the narrative world of these, both of these imagined groups, especially on the internet, I'm talking about memes, jokes, conspiracy theories on electronic social networks, but also in other tradition, like contemporary legends, rumors, anecdotes, started to radically diverge. They started to be different. Yeah. Because as uh, Amer American folklore said in 2017, these texts are fundamentally political acts. There were several synergic culture processes, processes causing this divergence. Yeah. Uh, one was the mo these modern narratives were usually much more inten intentional than older ones. Yeah. Because these memes and fake news, uh, I don't like to call them like this, but it's, it's, it's Prague Cafe term actually, the fake news. But uh, these, these terms were, are much more often disseminated for financial or economic reasons, yeah, people are collecting likes or clicks and or views yeah, to gain money, uh, or political or ideological reasons. Also, electronic social networks operate differently. And also, this is important, this, this text started to be quite a lot covered, co covered by mass media. Yeah. The breaking point was the so-called European refugee crisis of 2015. Yeah. When It was the breaking point when the Czech pub became more receptive to narratives, which Prague Cafe started to label as hoaxes, as disinformation, fake news, and all of these flashy new terms. Uh, the fake news was actually the Collins English Dictionary Award of the year 2017. So this is typical example, which was which is usually the tie to the Czech pub, which is not really true, but it's is a found wallet story. Maybe you heard it also in your respective countries. Yeah, there's a person, like a friend of a friend, finds a wallet full of money and IDs in a supermarket, on the street, in public transport, and in any public space, basically. It's lost the wallet, yeah, full of money. The owner is found. It's usually a Muslim woman or a man, more, more often a woman. Uh, uh, she or he offers money for the found wallet, is refused. 
uh, and instead it, go- it gives good advice. During certain period, especially Christmas, do not enter certain shopping mall, metro, public space, etc. And this is, it's not really uh, explicit, but impl- there's implication of Islamist terrorist attack. Yeah, there's some kind of, uh, this was quite a quite an important narrative in 2016. It started actually in Pilsen, in smaller town, famous for its Pilsen beer in the western uh, Czechia in mid-May 2016. Then it moved to Prague. It, in Prague, it was usually uh, it was tied to the big shopping center Palladium in the city center. You can see it in the picture. Uh, later, it went to Brno, which is the second largest city in the eastern part of the country. Uh, and it was declared false by Czech police at least three times, but it but it was it also became popular in tabloid press. Yeah, tabloid press uh, wrote a lot about this. Yeah, uh, people were, have been concerned, especially in these big shopping malls. The people who were, were, were uh, working there and so on. And actually, this is contemporary legend. It's urban legend called the Grateful Terrorist, which appeared first two weeks after the 9/11 attacks in New York in the U.S. in 2001. Uh, later in in, uh, in late 2000s, it appeared in the UK, and uh, later in Poland, and probably uh, it spread from Poland to Czechia uh, uh, during that European migration crisis. Yeah, and uh, which is uh, what is interesting. Uh, five or four years after after that the, this found wallet story we have the covid-19 pandemic situation and new type of narrative started started to appear which we can call liminal because they are crossing the borders between the cafe and pub yeah they are shared in 2000 uh, uh, the, the imagined culture threat posed by refugees or foreigners or, or terrorist attackers it was very crucial I- issue which di- was basically dividing the society yeah the Czech pub uh, love to talk about this uh, this imagined culture threat or physical threat. Yeah. The Prague Cafe uh, labeled this as hoaxes, as as fake news, as some some. But in 2000, uh, in 2020, new even more popular topic emerged: global pandemics of coronavirus, COVID-19. And unlike 2015, uh, social response to this issue became much more complicated. And we are still researching this. Bec- what is important, the, these fake ideological borders between the cafe and pub seem to partly dissolve, yeah, partly rearrange. And most importantly, both groups started to share several identical narrative themes and motives. So there's some, some kind of bonding. Yeah. This is typical shared narrative. Maybe you heard about this. It's also international, actually. Uh, this is typical example I collected in September last year. A colleague at work explained to me that his cousin wife hadn't been very well that day. She had fever, shortness of breath, and so on. Just the symptoms of coronavirus. So she decided to volunteer for paid testing. Yeah, it was it's September last year when the testing started, I don't know, in summer. When she arrived at the hospital, there was a huge queue. She registered at the entrance to a computer system before being released to stand the queue for a test. She stood there for about three hours. But when the queue didn't move at all, she told herself she wouldn't call it up, didn't get tested at all, and went home normally. But what was her surprise when she received an information a text message the next morning that COVID-19 was positive, that she's positive for COVID-19, and then believed that testing. Uh, this is contemporary legend, first documented by me in oral tradition, actually at one uh, folklore conference in Czechia in uh, September 14, 2003, people, all folklorists told me this story that happened to a friend of a friend uh, in Brno and other, uh, like a real story. Uh, later became very popular on Facebook and other social media. It was, it was uh, demanded by police. As, uh, and this is one of the several warning narratives or COVID narratives shared now, both by Prague Cafe and the Czech pub. So the COVID became like bonding device, actually, uh, in this narrative sphere. And last, last, uh, Last uh, presentation. There is no conclusion there yeah, because it's still going on. But uh, it seems, at least in in this in this kind of narrative, that COVID nineteen situation helped to strengthen real social bonds between people and erase some kind of artificial, stereotypical, ideological divides and labels created mostly by the social media. People started to share very similar narratives. Yeah, I'm not interested if these are true or not. Yeah. But, but they are the same, basically. Yeah. 
the cohesive and social bonding function of informal folkloric narratives are prominent, we all know, not only during pandemics, but generally during any similar social, economic, etc. crisis as well. Yeah. So it's 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 process which has been documented historically. Uh, uh, as Simon Bronner said, folklore is handy. Yeah, it can be easily used by anyone. And in this non-standard situation, uh, people started to use these stories. Yeah, and the same actual and FM narratives such as contemporary legend and rumors started to be shared by the boss group, which is interesting. Yeah, this divide is lessening, but. Uh, in the last few months, the new division started again with inclusion of the new genre, conspiracy theories, which are stereotypically more popular or stereotypically more connected with the Czech pub, yeah, not the Prague cafe. Yeah, but it, but so so it's so it was really actually short time during 2020 when these narratives were similar for the Czech pub and Prague cafe. Now it's there is a divergence mostly because of the conspiracy theories. Which became became much stronger late 2000 and early 2021. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, that's it. Thank you, uh, Petra, for, for this uh, valuable view into your uh, field research. I'm just wondering: uh, Are we sitting in the cafe or are we sitting in the pub? <laughs> Good, but maybe we can discuss this later. Um, well, let's uh, go to the next um, paper. Um, um, and may I introduce uh, Georgios Kuzas, uh, a young lecturer at Athens uh, University in Greece. And he will speak um, about from narration to performance and com commercializ commercialization the narration of urban legends as a profession in the modern city. Georgios, yeah. the floor is yours. Yes, my paper, my paper is connected with uh, Peter's. Um, hello, I'm very happy to be here uh, with all of you. It's my third time uh, that I participate in ACF Congress. I'm very happy to see again here Peter. Uh, we were together uh, in Jettingen four years with uh, before, and also Maria from Greece, Maria Kalyabu, we are also colleagues at uh, Hellenic Open uh, University. Uh, her, uh, tell me if it's okay. Uh, the screen. Just a moment. You can share it by yourself. Um, it's it's. Yes, down. yes, I'm, I'm sharing. I think that uh, in one minute will be okay. Ah, okay. It's okay. Yes, it works. I think that with uh, F5 uh, will be better. Dear friend, it is a fact that narration of fairy tales, as well as stories in general was quite often associated only with families, in which the mother or the grandmother narrated stories to the child. Nonetheless, this is an extremely traditional image that, to a big degree, has not been actually real even in traditional society. Folklore and historic research showed that such a distinction is not true anymore. Narration by a folk narrator is not a mechanical repetition for the tradition, but it's based on a series of conscious choices leading to the creation of the traditional material in the framework of oral speech. Nowadays, there are also famous narrators. This phenomenon is called neo-narration. I, I think that uh, oh, now it's better. Neo-narrators originate from the urban area and usually have no experimental relationship with folk tales. They have loved this genre and thus started narrating initially as amateurs and then professionally in companionships, schools, and as well as in coffee shops and patisseries. Such <coughs> practices fall in the procedure of traditionalization, through which a civilized legacy is signalized and formulated in the present. Here, we will also have to look in another parameter. In general, modern man enjoying the positive, but also talking into account the negative that the new way of life has provided to him, among which loneliness, alienation from nature, started to examine, among other things, his attitude 
toward narrations since you keep getting publishing that fairy tales and stories express the history of the natural. This way, transform what we can say today, a traditional narration, neo narration, arises which gradually gains more and more ground, finding a scope in libraries, school, prisons, hospitals, museums, bars, cultural places, and elsewhere. The movement from narration is being empowered internationally, and more and more teachers in the world are attempting to integrate narration in the learning procedure. In England, for example, the Society for Storytelling is established in 1993, which aims an, <coughs> at disseminating information regarding narration, organizing relevant meetings, and producing relevant publications. Neo narration as a technique and art is differentiated from traditional narration in the term of both the places of narration and the means used by narrators. Most of them have attended relevant seminars and lessons of theatrical education, and this is evident in the way of narration. Some of them are music, uh, have music to accompany their narration. The story they narrate stems from folk tradition, Greek and global. As for the methodological tools, uh, the method of research includes observation and participant observation. The access to the ethnographic field was decisive for the course of my research in this entirety. I did not consider it appropriate to use a covert strategy of access to the field. I revealed my identity from the beginning and the respondents were fully aware of who I was. After they had selected the areas where I could perform my initial field work, I followed three basic strategies of access. Creation of a group of communication with key, with key persons, the development of a web of relationships with the informants, this, and the snowball method. Also, in depth interviews, I did not use in my research objectivity tools, for example, some questionnaires, which on the one hand specify and objectify the results of the results, but on the other hand fail to provide us with the spontaneous reactions and answers of the subjects of the research. On the contrary, semi-structured questionnaires was used. The method of biography with life narrations was used. Often, one of my questions triggered the beginning of an extensive narration, which referred to the respondent's past. Thus, I let the informant narrate his personal story without interruptions and interferences. The method of focus groups with interviews of three or six persons with the, fr the, fr the framework of a multi-method approach is useful and significant since it uh, produces rich and in-depth ethnographic data. The main question is, new forms of narration in coffee shops, museums and restaurants and not art or a modern occupation? The big issue here is what is a, this is art or a job. The question is not so simple. In European countries and America, post-war and particularly during the last decades, there has been a generalized dissemination of satellite world relationships. It would, it would not be an exaggeration to support that dependent employment relationships were considered to be main source of income for the labor force in the framework of the capitalist method of production. However, this is uh, a restrictive view on the issues of work on the one hand, and the estimated and marginalized people or groups who were occupied with financially inferior, with low income, and without insular jobs. But such forms of work also come to work, outlet for many people in modern times. The narration of urban legends is such a work outlet. Nikos, 48 years old, pointed out in the term of this. I use narrate only for groups or friends. They had told me that I narrate well. I gradually started doing it more as a hobby, uh, which, however, ended up being my main job when I lost my job uh, in 2014, where the company I worked for shut down. For how much do I earn? Not even uh, 500 euros per month. But I consider this is to be my main job because I make a living by it. During the last years, the work process, both in urban and rural areas, is characterized by resilience, flexibility, non-performance, continuous mobility, and temporality. Today, in Europe, as well in American cities, a numerous uh, labor force is created, which consists of people working part-time, seasonally and occasionally, using, usually earning low salaries, being always on the move to work, and in an extremely risky resign, without having labor rights, 
and who mainly find a work outlet in a, a typical or low prestige jobs. Another narration. In my daily life, I am a teacher at a private school. I have been narrating stories to the children for many years, and this has helped me develop the art of narration. Here is uh, this coffee shop. I narrate legends and scary stories every Friday and Saturday, and I earn uh, 50 euros a day. Of course, this is a black label without stamps and insurance, but I don't care because I have a job, and for me, this is a small supplement. However, need for work does not uh, degrade narration to a mechanical procedure that is not related to art. We would say that is a job that uh, is art and technique together, since it brings with uh, it elements for the show that narration always has. The theatrical expressions, the changes in speak, the moves, and all those non-verbal characteristics, such as the intense look, as well as theatrical moves and elements of a dialogue between the narrator and his audience, to show <coughs> the directness of the narrator with the audience. For me, it's not just a job, it's my art and I feel that I am an artist. I have learned this art from my grandfather, who used to tell fairy tales to all the children in our village. He was the villager's storyteller, if you can put it in this way. And I work on it, I attend special seminars, and I consider narrating fairy tales or legends to be an inspiration and art. I only do it to be happy and to please my friends. I don't earn money as a reward. <laughs> I have uh, uh, enough, uh, another five minutes, it's okay. I think that I have uh, five minutes. The main principles of the successful use of narration. Even since the beginning of the research, I understood that narrators are not based only on their art to achieve their goal, uh, in exam to be liked, uh, liked by the audience. They adopt certain strategies for two reasons. First, to be effective and convincing to the audience, and second, to be competitive. In example, to manage, to manage not to make the audience bored and to wish to often visit the specific stair where they work. According to, <coughs> to the model suggested by Larry Brooks, the six core competencies of successful story tales, we can say that the principle proposed uh, from uh, the narrator are uh, the main idea, the idea on which the rest of the story is structured. Each story should contain a common message which wishes to be transmitted. This idea should be acknowledged from the beginning so that the pieces of the story which will have added are aligned and support this purpose. Character and heroes. Each story should have its leading actors. The main heroes and their role in the story should be clearly highlighted. Subject. Each story should have a subject scenario, which is uh, appropriately selected in order to highlight the main idea of the story. Structure. Particular emphasis should be given to the series sequence of the story's event. In example, which part comes first, which comes second, etc. Visualization. In traditional as a modern narration, the narrator should emphasize on the way in which he will present the story, the expression of his body, his face, his movements in the space and the interactions with the audience or other things that may participate in the story. Sound. Finally, a very significant factor in order to attract the instinct of the audience and to effectively use a story is the tone and the expression identified in the world voice of the narrator. Each story should be covered with the appropriate sound tone and voice tone every time in order to attract interest and to maximize the effective transmission, transmission of message and emotion to the audience and to create a climate of communication. Current affairs. During the last years and in the connection of urban legends with uh, current affairs is observed. Subject matters such as assassinations of known persons, urban legends regarding disease as COVID-19, theories about 5G network, as well as regarding people with uh, global dominance such as Bill Gates. The reasons are that these legends intrigue the public more and they wish to hear about them while at the same time as these are modern stories, these always can create by the narrator and more information can be added. Uh, I can show you some uh, photos uh, from the research and uh, 
we can see some uh, uh, performance with us also, uh, not only uh, narrators, but are also actors. And that's all. <coughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Georgios. Um, um, I would like to go, go to the places you, you made your, your field research. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, we have um, uh, some uh, famous uh, cafe here uh, in Athens. Uh, there are three, and uh, have uh, all these uh, uh, sweets uh, uh, which uh, were inspired from um, uh, the fairy tale world. We can say. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yes, uh, but it's uh, uh, very important to, to look at this. Uh, I call it um, the market or the marketplace of, of, of narratives and uh, mm-hmm. how this is uh, changing. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Um, now we are good in time. Um, I'm going to n- the next uh, paper from Carolina Kowala. She is a PhD student at University of Helsinki. And her paper is on no wise men or women, but real doctors. Narratives in the medical market of uh, Swedish-speaking Ostropotnia at the turn of the 20th century. Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for your kind introduction. So now we go a little bit backwards in time, 100 years. And um, yes, so I'm Karona Kovola, and I'm doing my PhD studies at the University of Helsinki in the study of religion. And my PhD study is part of the project uh, Invisible Forces Contact with the Supernatural in Two Languages, founded by the Swedish Cultural Foundation in Finland. This paper is based on a draft uh, of my third article of my article based PhD thesis that discusses the Swedish language vernacular narratives uh, about the cunning folk or kluga folk in Swedish. Uh, overall aim of my thesis is to answer the question, what can we say about vernacular beliefs in Swedish-speaking Ostrobothnia in Finland based on narratives about people who were told to practice witchcraft or to possess other kinds of supranormal skills that are connected to magic? In this presentation, uh, I survey magical healing in medical marketplace in Swedish-speaking Ostrobotnia in late 19th and early 20th centuries, in intertextual discourses of local newspaper texts and vernacular narratives. Establishment of modern medicine in rural, rural sites created tension in the medical market that was previously dominated by vernacular and magical healers. By looking at the stigmatizing discourses in the newspapers, we can see that concepts of vernacular beliefs about healing with supernormal means were common in the region and that vernacular magical healers were popular actors in the medical market of the Swedish-speaking pre-modern Ostrobotnia to an extent that they were argued against in the public discourse. This analysis brings new information about the stigmatizing discourses on vernacular beliefs when a community is undergoing changes that affect health concepts. I apply this cause analysis as a method to analyze the patterns of structures in the source material. For this paper, I defined a uh, following fair flow, uh, this course as a semiotic ways of constructing aspects of the word, world, physical, social, or mental, which can generally be identified with different positions or perspectives of different groups of social actors. I understand the object of this study, magical healing, as an objectified theme that is constructed in discursive practices. Term magical healing refers to healing practiced by ritual specialists known as the cunning folk or kluga folk, with spells and rituals that are based on vernacular healing schemas. This definition helps to distinguish magical healing from non-magical vernacular healing that is excluded from the source material. In rural Ostrobotnia, the cunning folk held the authority in magical healing that was based aforementioned healing schemas shared by the cunning folk and the community in which they were practicing their uh, skills. Medical market has been defined loosely to cover suppliers of medical services who provide their medical treatment from their own standpoints and the patients who buy medical treatment of which they have little knowledge of. 
I understand the medical market as the context in which the cunning folk, physicians and their patients operated in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when there were several actors providing healthcare in Ostrobotnia. Patients' condition and personal history affect interpretations of an illness and when they seek help in the medical market, when different parties make claims for medical knowledge that can help the patients to improve their health. There is evidence that patients in the rural communities applied both instances, magical healers and physicians in times of need. This reflects the fluid st uh, structure of the medical market. At the end of the 19th century, uh, it should be mentioned that the density of physicians network in Finland was one of the lowest in Finland. Because of this, the rural patients might have not had any other option than to visit the vernacular healers who were more close to them. Um, as a data um, for this article, uh, I use textual vernacular narratives archived at the Society of Swedish Literature in Finland and digitalized newspaper texts archived at the National Library of Finland. These both text types are understood as primary sources for intertextual analysis. Textual folklore corpus of this article consists of 23 narratives from Swedish-speaking Ostrobotnia. And you can see on the map the location of Ostrobotnia. It's right uh, next to the, um, of the Swedish um, coastline. Of course, there's the sea in the between. <laughs> These narratives were chosen based on their context. They connect the magical healing or cunning folk with medicine somehow. Most of the folklore sources applied were collected between the 1910s and 1930s. I have supplemented this material with vernacular narrative data that illuminates different discourses in the regional context. This additional data consists of uh, 34 vernacular narratives. To answer the question how magical healing was narrated in public discourse in Swedish-speaking Ostrobothnia, I have applied Swedish language newspaper texts between the years 1848 and 1917 in Ostrobothnia region. And I have conducted searches in national bibliographies, digitalized corpus of new papers with research words and newspapers that you can see on the slide here, if you're familiar with a Swedish language. Um, of these results, I chose uh, 61 newspaper texts as the main data corpus for newspaper texts that represent public discourse of magical healing. In addition, I added three newspaper texts that discuss similar issues, but don't necessarily have... Um, magical healing it. And uh, this table illustrates how number of newspaper texts about magical healing are the highest in between 1880 and 1899, with uh, 39 texts out of 61. During this time, newspaper descriptions were growing, so it's not perhaps a uh, surprise that also the um, amount of the newspaper articles was growing. And in the rural areas, people read them together. Therefore, an individual's ability to read did not affect how public discourses were transmitted. It can be argued that during those decades, newspaper texts about magical healing reached wide audiences. There are several reasons why number of texts about magical healing increased at the end of the 19th century. But the main reason is most likely that the healthcare system in Finland underwent reforms in late 19th century after a great famine in uh, 1867 and 68. Due to the time limit, I will present uh, only shortly uh, two examples of discourse types that I have been able to find in my data. The underlying presumption in my paper is that different healing schemas affected how rural populations as actors in the medical market were narrated. As it has been argued by several scholars, vernacular healing schemas rely on external cause of illness, whereas conventional medicine seeks to heal illnesses that originate inside the patient. And these are just rough um, um, explanations, of course. Uh, confrontations between vernacular healing and medicine have to do with the status and authority of the vernacular healers in their community. In vernacular narratives, cunning folk represent symbolic power of healthcare that becomes later associated with physicians, and we can see this change in several narratives in both text types in which vernacular and modern healing schemas are combined. Um, I will give you a short example of uh, vernacular, nar vernacular nar narratives. And these are about the same person, vernacular magical healer called Hemis Haig. 
And um, these narratives about him are from the same interviewee, and they have been recorded between uh, in the 1950s to 1970s, somewhere between those decades. And um, having uh, these two, two narratives um, explain that he has had access to doctoral books that indicates that he knew and could utilize medical knowledge, although we don't know exactly what these books were. Medical books were recommended also by newspaper text as medical authority in cases where it was impossible to reach physicians. So although he mishake uh, was rumored to heal people with spells and rituals, vernacular narratives about him placed him into a broader framework. Um, well, vernacular narratives that tell how magical healer could heal illnesses that physicians could not can be read as a response to the modernizing discourses on health values, emphasizing abilities of vernacular healers in contrast to physicians. In the data analyzed in this article, there are 11 vernacular narratives that contrast magical healing with modern medicine. Most of these narratives fall into three categories that are uh, physicians uh, trust the healing of, the, of a magical healer more than themselves. Uh, the physicians uh, do not understand the nature of the disease or they cannot heal it, for example, because of its supranormal origin. And uh, I would argue that this had to do with established nature of vernacular healing schemas and their collation with modern medicine and healthcare reforms in the 19th century. Uh, next, uh, as an example of stigmatizing discourses in the newspapers about, but also in vernacular narratives, I would like to introduce uh, quickly uh, religious discourse. There are 10 newspaper texts that associate magical healing with practices that were against Christianity or had to do with the devil. Most of these texts are published in the late 19th century. Uh, during that time, new revival movements such as Pietism and Lestadianism became more popular in Ostrobothnia making the religious landscape more shattered than before. By the early 19th, 20th century, revival movements had in Ostrobothnia the strongest adherence in Finland. Uh, stigmatizing discursive practices towards magical healing contained othering magical healing as superstition that blossomed among people who considered themselves as God, God's children or who claimed to heal with God's help. The role of a magical healer was ambiguous. For example, a vernacular narrative from Pedro Sere uh, tells how certain old women who practiced magical healing were examples of superstition or witchcraft with which one could do both good and evil. As an intertextual, intertextual reference, a newspaper article uh, discusses the devil and vernacular beliefs. The text claims that believing that witches can affect the world in a good or bad way with help from the devil uh, is a superstition that should be worked against, says the newspaper. And um, just quickly going forward, um, on the other side, uh, according to the tradition collector Walter Forsblom, uh, Ostrobothnian magical healers who healed with uh, secret medicine uh, did not want to be associated with witches because of the catechism that, that identi identifies them with the devil. And this did not prevent vernacular narratives associating uh, these people with the devil. Uh, regardless of stigmatizing association between the cunning folk and the devil in narrative tradition, some people still chose their uh, healing in the medical uh, fear. And, um, and I see that my time is running out. So I just um, quickly go to the conclusions so we can have time for discussion. You have uh, three minutes. Oh, three minutes. Okay. Perfect. So then I can quickly say something about that. <laughs> so, um, um, yes, and, and that patients uh, did not want to uh, seek help from people who were condemned as witches, according to Forrest Bloom, who says that uh, also their patients did not want to say that they uh, visited magical healers. Uh, who used witchcraft, but they still visited some magical heroes, uh, might be an, a way to avoid stigma by association, as uh, presented by Pesco Solido and Martin, um, by socially distancing oneself from a publicly stigmatized practice. This might reflect in some narratives uh, that describe famous vernacular heroes who were also known to use healing spells or rituals as skeptical towards superstition and distinguishing themselves from magical practices. Although healing spells often ended with a blessing following Christian prayers, the vernacular healing practice was still recognized as superstition and not having anything to do with Lutheran church. 
Force Plum noted that these people uh, that to heal or Laga Om uh, was not considered as witchcraft. That is, uh, the Laga Om is an um, inscription that describes healing with uh, uh, spells and healing with uh, incantations. Um, it is of the Bosnian dialect. Uh, instead, it, it should be seen as a way to heal illness, which has been passed on for generations. And here we can see quite a um, heritageizing uh, point of view to this same narrative or same narratives. But uh, to conclude, <laughs> it has been my uh, pleasure to present uh, my research findings about the newspaper discourses on magical healing in late 19th uh, Ostrobotnia. Unfortunately, uh, due to time restrictions, uh, I could not venture deeper into my analysis, as it always happens when one gets to speak about their research. Uh, however, already from this brief presentation, we can see that the newspapers narrated magical healing in a, a little bit stigmatizing manner. The revival movements had a history in the region and contemporaries were active in the revival movements. New medical innovations and concern that the population did not receive the best healthcare possible affected how this concern was put forward in the newspapers. I would argue that there already was contradicting attitudes towards magical healing and spells among the population that stigmatized people who were rumored to know such spells and rituals. But nevertheless, vernacular healing schemas uh, were not changed overnight. Please do not hesitate to contact me for questions, comments, or suggestions. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, we really uh, like to, to hear more about your research, but um, the time is short, but uh, it's been a very valuable uh, insight and uh, I, I think it's very uh, interesting uh, how the narratives um, um, yeah I think it's a kind of uh, transgressing the, the borders um, and I, th I think these are uh, discourses um, we also know for, for for example from Germany and uh, I think there are a um, lot of similarities um, especially the border between religion and uh, superstition, Some people say religion is superstition or religion is a kind of magic. And also a lot of these um, vernacular practices, um, they come from religious practices. But um, they are, so, so the frontiers are, are very manifold. Well, now we have time for the discussion. Thank you very much for the time discipline. And um, I, I think it's two possibilities. For example, you... you Uh, hold up hands um, or virtually or you write your uh, comments and questions uh, to the chat so I can uh, can uh, give it to the to the speakers any questions um, any comments to these uh, very interesting um, papers P uh, Piotr yes uh, can you hear me yes Yeah, so thank you very much for all very interesting presentation. And uh, I have questions to Alf and maybe at the same time to Georgios. So uh, uh, according to your presentation, the, uh, the picture of storytelling, I would like to ask if you notice in your research any negative aspects of storytelling so as we all uh, very well know with with uh, telling with with narration we can we can cheat people we can humiliate people uh, uh, ridicule and so on so uh, if if this situation occur occur uh, in the, in the case of storytelling uh, Uh, so can you can you see something about that if you if you uh, noticed such situation in your in your research thank you thank you for the question uh, no i didn't uh, notice uh, something like that because uh, i can say that uh, uh, in uh, the cafe everything is money uh, that means uh, uh, that uh, with man uh, all these actors and uh, the narrators Uh, must um, say uh, beautiful and uh, very uh, kindly things uh, to the audience. And uh, we don't have um, uh, the reactions like uh, in uh, the traditional societies. 
Uh, also, uh, you know, uh, I will um, say again, everything is money. That means that uh, is a way of work. And uh, if you don't do uh, a good job, uh, you cannot be in the same place uh, next year uh, uh, from September. And uh, uh, that's why uh, we don't find, I think that uh, we cannot find such uh, reactions. And I would like to add uh, 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 on uh, that there's quite quite a difference between uh, the the storyteller I've been studying and uh, those Georgios tell us about. Uh, but uh, the result is uh, more or less the same. Uh, uh, the people I uh, I've been speaking to they, they are. Uh, quite many of them ha have this teacher role. Some of them are teachers or they go to schools to perform. Uh, so there are some implicit rules of uh, keeping a high ethical uh, standard in wh what to, to tell. Uh, and uh, Th this is part of th this kind of revival uh, re rhetoric uh, that, that is storytelling is basically good. Uh, there are some examples uh, like advertisements, um, like we, we had a couple of examples here, here in uh, Umeå where uh, there have been advertisement for restaurants and so on, and they have made up a good story about who founded the restaurant in 1920, came a poor sailor and started. Uh, and, and there has been very negative response in, in the local papers be, be, because the uh, uh, PR Bureau has been cheating the, the public with uh, lie, uh, stories of lies and uh, uh, so uh, th there is uh, mm, uh, well, well the kind of ideological uh, uh, cloud that is around all this storytelling is uh, on uh, not harming others or uh, s spreading lies. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, an ideological cloud, because that's, as I said, uh, is a work. Uh, that means, uh, because you said about the advertisement, uh, these uh, actors also uh, make advertisement. Uh, they go around uh, the coffee shops, uh, they are in the street and they say, come here to hear our fairy tales. They are also, um, uh, they are also uh, making advertisement of uh, the cafe. I don't uh, think that we have uh, any theological context. They are not like, um, in any case, like uh, the fairy tales of the past, the villages. And uh, also, you say that... Uh, the, uh, we have some schools. Also here in Greece, uh, we have um, uh, the last 10 years, uh, the first school for um, uh, the uh, urban legends uh, storytelling, as we can say. Uh, that means uh, how uh, you can uh, tell uh, an urban legends uh, with uh, efficiency. Uh, they have also, as I said, uh, some main characteristics. They have a structure, they have... Uh, uh, the performance, the visualization. Uh, but uh, I don't think that uh, we can uh, speak for ethics. I think that uh, it's better to speak for strategies. Uh, and uh, uh, the point of view uh, of my paper, uh, it's not um, uh, so much uh, the narratives as narratives, but uh, the narratives as uh, a strategy of uh, survival uh, nowadays. Okay. Uh, can I ask you something uh, like that, uh, uh, Peter? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to ask you, uh, Peter, 
Uh, if uh, in uh, your country you have uh, the same cafe uh, with uh, storytelling uh, and uh, urban legends, with the suites and all these uh, uh, things. You mean me, you're just. Okay. Yes, you. Uh, no, we don't have a huge storytelling movement like uh, Nordic countries or or Germany. We have. It's it's not big thing here actually. It started like five years ago. There are some events, mm -hmm. but mostly in Prague and big cities, and it's very small compared compared even to Poland and other Eastern European countries. I think we don't have storytelling movement as such. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very isolated events. Uh, which are just one-time events. You, you don't have a cafe when you can go and, and listen to some storytelling. It's, it's, it's not there. We used to have some, uh, some stage performance storytellers uh, during the communist times, especially in the 50s and 60s. It was a very popular form. They tried to, uh, they tried to imitate like, local rural storytellers, but it basically died out in the 60s because it was very uh, non-authentic. People didn't like it because it was basically a guy on the stage telling rural jokes and rural stories, and it died out in the 60s. And we have these modern storytellers, especially uh, inspired, I don't know why, by Norwegian storytellers. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We have one storytelling school, but it's not a big thing here. Yeah? When we ask average people, guy on the street, what is storytelling? They will not know. It's it's not. I don't know. I don't know why, but it's not here. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. There, there's a question from uh, Claudia Wilms. Since the Czech uh, example, I'm thinking of shared narratives in milieus and which ethics they are carrying and what experiences they are expressing. Yeah, it's not really a question. It's more commentary. <laughs> But I'm thinking of this, okay. yeah, because it's clear that in Germany we have uh, similar uh, things that, uh, after the COVID uh, uh, crisis, so that there are shared, uh, more shared uh, fairy tales uh, now uh, between the milieus. And this is mm -hmm. uh, quite interesting, but I'm thinking about... Mm, was it was it so different before? I'm not really sure. So I just wanted to make this commentary mm -hmm. uh, and and which uh, experiences such uh, stories are uh, gathering, so bringing together. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's uh, uh, it's uh, I think too. It's it's a uh, interesting uh, point uh, about thinking about the milieus. Because also um, with uh, COVID-19, there, there has been uh, the, the um, transgress transgression of the, of the borders between milieus. Um, because um, something um, really new and uh, people uh, couldn't co uh, cope with it at, uh, in the beginning. And so uh, the, the narratives could uh, switch um, the milieus uh, more easy than before. I think this is um, very... Uh, interesting aspect and maybe uh, that's because uh, especially in germany um the the, the right wing populists uh, try to to, uh, to to connect to these um anti uh, anti pandemic um, measure, measure demonstrations because they saw this is a possibility to to, to bring their own populist narratives um to the middle of the of, of society so um this leads to one, um, if there is no other question. Um, uh, I, I, I would connect to the first question. Um, I, I'm thinking about um, a storytelling uh, and populism. Um, how can we say um, populism um, uses a storytelling or populism itself is a, type, is a, is a kind of storytelling? And um, which narratives um, are told? It's, it's, it's not... It's it's a political market of storytelling, populism. Um, but how can we bring together these uh, two aspects? What do you uh, think? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, but maybe Everybody maybe it, sorry, but maybe the uh, ethics. The, yeah, maybe the ethics and morality is helping us a bit in this question, because I think the stories are linked with some kind of morality and ethics, and these uh, mm -hmm. these are linking these groups together so that they share 
uh, some basic grounds uh, of these, uh, for example, like racism or something, uh, or to um, yeah to question uh, state um, uh, affairs or something. So there there are some some foundational um, uh, yeah relation relationness. Re yeah, relatedness, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe ethic in, in in an ethical way. Yeah, maybe somebody else has. Yeah, there mm -hmm. is some kind of uh, basic distrust of of uh, politicians and the elite, um, journalists, uh, scientists, and um, probably the the right wing people and the, the anti COVID, anti mouth mask, and anti vax. Um, uh, movements have di uh, that um, distrust in, in common. So, uh, and then that's in the stories as well, because, um, well, uh, uh, the 5G towers are making us sick or they are communicating with um, um, the, the microchips that are in the vaccines. And that's all orchestrated by the elite by uh, the government, by uh, politicians, because they want to control us and they want to rule over us. And that's something I think uh, right-wing uh, um, uh, right movements and perhaps also um, very conservative religious uh, groups and um, uh, health, care, health and, and, and um, uh, how do you say it? Well, uh, the people in in the health uh, department <laughs> that believe they they share these thoughts and they in the Netherlands they come together uh, to protest against the, the government and and uh, virologists etc and they find each other and these groups were never together before uh, it wasn't the, the, the yoga the yoga women never. Uh, came together with uh, uh, the, the neo-Nazi people, um, uh, and, and there are even interviews with these yoga women who said, yeah, well, of course, uh, in the past I voted left-wing, I voted uh, Party for the Animals or the Green Party, and now they voted very right-wing because of all these developments uh, during the COVID crisis. So that's my two cents. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure, Manis, uh, you, you want to to say something? Yes. Um, yeah, it's a pity that Sebastian Lümling left us like just in time because I think he's working on this topic um, uh, to connect um, populism and um, the research on narrative culture. And I would yeah, even say that you could... Uh, analyze populism as one form of folklore and it's especially interesting who the folk is in populism so I think that this question is really important and very productive if we think about it because the production of a we and them as Theo also already introduced it, um, is crucial for this yeah mm -hmm. thank you uh, the next has been uh, Claudia Yes, I wanted to react on Theo, so I'm not totally um, agree with him. So because um, I think it's not that easy because I'm as a anthropologist and I think you as well, we are all uh, part of a skepticism world. So we are always uh, doubting uh, things, uh, state affairs and other things. Uh, and also uh, our research is because we know the methods and so we are also questioning methods. So we we are also some part of this uh, a doubtful, uh, I don't know, no, milieu, uh, but in a different way. So I just want to say there, there are other... Um, there are other differences between... Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I can understand what you say, and I do want to understand what people believe and why do why they do believe it and what kind of groups there are and what people don't believe. But I'm, I'm not going so far that I um, maybe uh, believe that there are microchips in vaccines. 
it's re really, uh, and that Bill Gates have been developing them to get the world under control. I mean, that's just outrageous. That yeah, exactly. for me is, is an urban legend. Yeah, so there's the, the difference, but uh, I think that this is, we have to uh, be a bit more concrete in these differences. Maybe that's what I wanted to say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because this is helping us not to say, okay, populism is just this one. Uh, it is more than, than, than just uh, to, yeah, to have these uh, storytellings or to doubt, uh, to, to doubt uh, the regime or something. It is more than this. Yeah, but I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Marina. Yes, um, no, I only wanted to uh, make a little comment to Theo too, um, because I think um, it is true that uh, you, now with the pandemic situation, um, of course, we see this um, this storytelling as vehicle of. Um, of uh, conspiracy th uh, thinking and, and a lot of things where uh, a lot of actors that never came together in the past are together now. Um, but I think um, maybe we are, uh, we made the observation of the very explicit forms of expression, of social expression as movements, the, lo the, the people uh, on the streets uh, uh, and so far. From, from my experience in the very so everyday life, uh, I was uh, very surprised how uh, uh, how popular were at least the moment of doubt of the doubt uh, among people. No? Uh, and, and this doubt are the, the are elements in this storytelling and in these discourses that at least uh, lead to this movement, uh, uh, populist movement on conspiracy um, theories, uh, to to mobi mobilize uh, people on the streets. Um, so I think only um, maybe um, we have a problem to recognize as a scientist um, and researcher and that we think a lot about ethic and uh, a lot of things um, from a very uh, humanistic perspective. Um, yes, how popular are certain uh, elements of thinking like uh, conspiracy, uh, the power of doubt, uh, um, uh, also the the um, uh, distrust. I think it was more popular than we thought. We thought always that uh, people were very rational, and the rational were the people that uh, 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 go to the, the to the very right side of, of politics. And um, but actually, um, maybe there there were a lot of people that were not on the street uh, with with the populist movement and the right movements, but they share a lot of elements of thinking and of doubt and, and uh, with the pandemic with the pandemic situation that was visible. And I think it's mm -hmm. very disgusting and annoying for us maybe to see that and to handle with this situation. That's all. Mm -hmm. So only I so, saw uh, a reflection. <laughs> yes, um, um this is a, a very important point. It's it, it's also a question of of our methods, and I, I think there are very interesting uh, links to to Carolina's uh, project, because um, this this cl clash between um, medicine and yeah vernacular beliefs um, mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand uh, too, who is speaking and um, how is um, uh, how do we think? Um, how many people are uh, speaking? This is a point uh, being discussed uh, the, the last month uh, a lot. And um, historical working has, has the opportunity, okay, I got these newspapers, um, but uh, you also probably never know how, pe how many people are thinking um, the one or the other point. There has been a, a comment uh, from uh, Better, um, you should uh, copy it uh, maybe for if you are interested. Uh, I, I think uh, we can 
we can go on uh, in the in the next discussion. Um, but we are now at the end of the time. Um, I've uh, just uh, shortly. We have to log out of this session and then log into the next session, um, which is uh, starting soon. And maybe we can pick up this uh, discussion too. But I've you all already uh, raised your hand. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to uh, comment on on Carolina and uh, and uh, your observation of, of this rather fluid, uh, uh, not, not those sharp di distinction be between the uh, vernacular and the uh, school medicine and. Uh, uh, across the Baltic Sea in Vestrobotnia. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a similar picture from, from that period. And um, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I also just want, wanted to uh, point out, it's a good thing that you go to the local newspapers uh, of the late 19th century, because I think that's... Uh, uh, a rich source, especially when, when you go out in, in countryside uh, newspapers, where, where you re really can get, get a picture of the social life uh, in quite another way than in the uh, big city newspapers. Uh, so it's, um, I think that's a good choice of you. Thank you. Yes, thank okay, you for fine. Your thank you for all... <laughs> Thank yeah, you for I was, the discussion and all of the comments. Um, our time is off and uh, Ines, um, we see her again. Thanks a lot for, for the support. And um, we see you soon in the second session of the panel. And I really look forward to the upcoming um, papers. See you soon. <laughs>